Welcome to Cancer in Peace. My name is Sean Stewart, and I'm here with my good friend, Peter Scalzo, 18-year cancer journey. Is it 19 or 18? Yeah, I 19. Think 19. Yeah. yeah, 19 now, yeah. yeah. I should know that by now, right? You should. Yeah. Yep. You are You are the, uh, what What are you again? Facilitator? Facilitator, yeah. <laughs> Not a mathematician, facilitator. Mathematician. Yeah, get that right. <laughs> So uh, today we're going to just kick a new topic around, and yeah. it's one that I think it's really applicable in the cancer and peace space, mm -hmm. but uh, it's one that I really connected with a bunch in recovery circles, Yeah, and I think you're going to definitely have a lot to share in this space too as, a, as the cancer journey. So the topic is uh, connecting with your powerlessness. Yeah, I and I think in church circles, and I'm going to pinpoint that to evangelical circles. I know that's not supposed to be a good word right now, but it's the only word I know how to use for this, is that there's probably a controversy about the concept of powerlessness, I think, for Christians. And and I think the spectrum would be exercising authority and, you know, how we can make a mountain move versus you know, surrender, submitting that we are not, pow that we don't have, you know, we're powerless. So I think it's, it's an interesting discussion. Yeah. Uh, when we would do a, a step study in recovery, one of the questions that uh, yeah. it just sticks out to me all the time. And, and it's early on in like one of the first uh, books that we go through as, as yeah. we walk through the steps, it was, what do you have the power to control Yeah, in your life? Correct. And then, and, you know, I think, that answer changed a bunch over the years for me as I've done yeah. that a few times. And so I guess I'll throw it to you in your cancer space. What do you have the power to control in your cancer journey? Yeah. So I've, uh, I, my, my stock answer now is that I have power over how I'm going to respond. Um, like I can process emotions. I'm, I'm at that point in my life where I can process emotions. I can choose. I can have certain choices. For instance, uh, currently I'm struggling with blood clotting and kidney uh, issues and all that. I don't have control over those things going on in my body. But how am I going to respond? Am I going to get down and depressed? Am I going to um, get out of denial and deal with the reality of what's going on. You know, how am I going to respond to what's going on? So um, that's what I feel like I have control over right now. And same thing in the cancer space. I mean, who would ever choose to get a cancer diagnosis? So you have no control over that. And then the way the disease progresses, you know, people, the only way I've seen people sort of try to quote control their cancer journey is getting on special diets and things like that. But I think, you know, exercising more, that kind of thing. But I think those are just kind of responsible things to do. You know what I mean? And just because you do those things doesn't mean it's going to control the, 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 the disease, the outcome, all that. Yeah. I'll put it. That's really good because you're describing there's some tensions out there yeah. that we should talk about in this. Um, <clears throat> And inside of tensions, there's concepts that I think it's really important. The, the recovery words, I think, are that we would hear as we came to believe um, that we needed a power greater than ourselves um, to help us heal, recover from our sin issues or our right. uh, harmful behavior. Right. And so that if we think it comes from inside of ourselves right. and we go from that perspective that we will fail. Yeah. And cancer is probably similar if we think that if a person thinks that their healing can come just from inside themselves without a power greater than themselves, right. um, you haven't embraced powerlessness. And and that's a problem in so many areas of our lives is that yeah. um, it would be like saying, hey, um, the key to a great life is to you know, just be moral and be good people and everything's yeah. going to work out. Yeah, And it ignores uh, something that is... There's our sin nature, our, yeah. our, what's inside of us, um, our desire to do wrong and the things that we have done. There's not a single person on earth who hasn't done wrong. And, right. and so it gets to this idea of that, well, you actually need a power that's greater than yourself to manage this. Yeah. I think, um, 
Sean, in the cancer context, it's, you know, we've embraced recovery, 12 step recovery. And our argument is that it does apply to a cancer journey, which I think is really unique. And, you know, growing up, I was intrigued and attracted to those situations in which there was a clear authority and a clear subordinate, like let's say the military, even that analogy, whatever. But there was something attractive to me that uh, I am to listen and, and to be under a greater authority than, than me. And, and I always was intrigued by that. And um, then when I thought about, I, I had an attraction to people who understood their powerlessness within the context of addiction. Uh, so I, I was attracted to 12 steppers. I didn't know why. Like mm -hmm. I was like, you know, what about that is really sort of drawing me into it. And I think it's because they recognize that they really are powerless over that addiction. They can't manage it on themselves, on their own, and they needed a higher power. And then I think for me, um, that sea change event that I've talked about so many times, but that 14th surgery being in ICU uh, with uh, metastatic cancer, basically facing an end of life process after a 10 hour surgery. And I think that, that that's the, f that, that was probably the first time I felt emotionally, spiritually, and physically bankrupt. I mean, to the mm -hmm. point where I couldn't manage my emotions anymore. <clears throat> the fear, anger, and sadness took over, especially the fear. And um, spiritually, I was like, God, you have abandoned me. Uh, I couldn't, there's nothing, I didn't have any control over any of it. And then physically, my body was all cut up. And, and so that was, I think, like a really stark realization that I am really not in control, even of my own self. Yes, this and, is what I want to talk about. Yeah, about. and so it was like, oh my gosh, what do I do? Kind of thing. Yes, everything yeah. else in prior to this has been an illusion of control. Yep. And that's, that's um, you know, what started me thinking about this topic before you know, we talked earlier that I wanted to talk about this a bit. And uh, I heard uh, this interview with, um, is an actor, uh, Shia LeBlanc, I think is his name. Um, and he was up and coming. At, did I say it right, Jack? I don't know. I'm looking over at Jack because yeah. I have no idea who that yeah. is. You'd only Jack only a millennial Young, would know so these mean, things, right? Yeah, Jack Younger. LaBeouf. LaBeouf. Maybe that's it. Yeah, sorry. Got the bat last thing wrong. I'm not. <laughs> anyway, the, there was this interview with him and, and he was like up and coming, you know, transformers, always kind of, he was yeah. um, in, in the circles, you know, working with A-listers and he, <coughs> sorry about that. He came from a background uh, of having little and he worked his way up with all his talent, skills and right. abilities, but uh, he blew himself up and he had an addiction issue and then in that addiction issue, uh, with that addiction, he abused the women around him. And I think somebody filmed him or something like that. I don't know the whole story uh -huh. behind it, but uh, he was caught uh, being abusive towards, uh, I think, a girlfriend or his wife or something. Uh -huh. And and this is in the time of Me Too. Everybody figured out that, hey, this guy's an abuser. And so he went from being uh, somebody who was up and coming, working with A-listers to a pariah. And he enters into a rehab facility and in the rehab facility, what happens to him is, uh, you know, they have, you know, he's working on his addiction there and then they have family members that come once a week or friends could come visit. And it was like week after week after week, uh, nobody showed up because nobody wanted to be around the pariah. And so oh. <laughs> there was this illusion of power he had of, he was controlling his destiny. He had made his way. And then, when his life blew up, he came to this deep poverty of there's not even a single person who wants to be in my sphere because, you know, I am, you know, the worst of the worst people, you know, I'm an abuser of women. Mm. And so it was such a great share. And, and he went on from there and, and, and eventually somebody did show up and he's like, it saved my life that somebody actually showed grace to me in my powerlessness, in my, unworthiness that somebody showed that to us, which I think this is an example of the walls. We've talked about the wall moment in our life and I, and it, it really struck me though, just how, 
you know, the powerlessness concept played out, but something that he said that uh, was later on in this interview and it was, you know, it was one of the greatest gifts that he had and it mirrored your cancer story. And this is that in every other circumstances, he could always, there was always a door or crack that he could try to manipulate right. to spin things, to make himself, you know, to, to change the circumstances, to work his way out of it, to get into good graces, to do all that. But now he was put into a position where his earth was completely uh, shattered. Everybody knew that he was a worthless, you know, in his words, piece of crap. Um, and there was nobody who wanted to spend time with him and be around him because of that. And it was one of the greatest gifts because he got to powerlessness. Uh, he had no power to manipulate people. He had no power to use his influence. He had no influence left. And it just struck me how important it was because this started for him a, a spiritual journey mm -hmm. because he got to powerlessness. And it's such an important part of a cancer journey is what you just described a second ago was like in every, what stuck out to me is like when you shared your journey at one of the things that we've talked about a few times in this podcast was on your journey, there was a time when there was always a medical solution. Mm -hmm. It was as if there was power to step into something or there might mm -hmm. be something that could be accessed manipulated, worked on, mm -hmm. um, that you could put yourself into those hands and th there was a solution. Right. And I think that was his point too. It's like, he could always come with a solution, a way to right. work back into the system, even when he messed up in the past. But this surgery for you was your moment of powerlessness. Right. And what an important part of the journey. Mm -hmm. If you don't get to powerlessness, you don't actually get to peace, I think. And mm -hmm. that's a strong statement, but you can tell me whether or not you agree with that or not. And I can, I'll give you the reason yeah. why I think mm -hmm. if you want just to, because, yeah. um, when we're in charge of chasing our solution, you're working from anxiety mm -hmm. because if I know that I'm the author of my solutions and it's dependent on me to perform, to meet whatever that standard is, whether it be standard in how I live my life or the standard in how I get to recovery in issues in my life or the standard for figuring out my solution for survival in a cancer journey, yeah, there's going to be anxiousness there. And mm -hmm. so the reason why powerlessness is, is it destroys all of that illusion of thinking that I have any control at all anyway. Right. And so that's, that's my premise. And you can yeah. now speak about it in terms well, of your own experience. I think the practical aspect for me is when I try to control my situation or other people um, to get an outcome that I think the outcome should be, I'm a mess. And what comes out is mud. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. nothing really good comes out of yeah. it. In fact, what comes out is my codependency, my anxiety, my anger, and that kind of thing. I've always been intrigued by this concept that Jesus put out there about deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Now, now to me, denying myself means to accept the fact that I don't have the answers. And, and if, if you've ever been around a person who thinks they have the answers, you know, you know how, dude, I've been around me. <laughs> But like recognizing that, I th I think denying myself means to recognize that I really have no power. I can choose to respond a certain way, but I really have over people, over circumstances, over my illness, whatever. But taking up the cross for, for me means that, that um, living a crucified life is all about accepting my powerlessness, right? I love that phrase. You came up with it, I think, or you'll give credit to somebody else. But Going through the acceptance process to accept the fact that I truly am powerless, I think, is a huge reality, and a and a it it really shifts things. Uh, f for me, it was a sea change. And then, follow me to me is the whole higher power concept. I so I, I love the that I think what Jesus was saying was, "Blessed are the poor in spirit." With that phrase, and I know you you mentioned poverty and. A lot of times I used to view poverty as like an evil, like a bad thing, a terrible thing. Yeah. Yet the scriptures confuse me because like blessed are the poor in spirit, 
blessed are the poor. You know, some translations don't have in spirit in that. They just say blessed are the poor, right? And so I was wondering, well, what, you know, what is so blessed about poverty? I'm going to hand it back to you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, what's blessed about poverty is um, that's the place where grace begins. Meaning whenever I'm doing things in my own power and I'm doing it out of my own wealth, I don't depend on others. I don't get unmerited or more unwarranted favor. I don't accept gifts. When I'm working from, and I've worked from being wealthy enough that I would never ask for anything. And I was a self-made man and there was no room for grace because pride of I did this, I'm doing that always stood in the way. Mm. And the, the thing that happens in poverty is you start working from a place of grace and grace is an incredible gift to receive. Mm. Um, and it is actually the gift that we all have to receive uh, to deal with our own brokenness, our own sinfulness, our own evilness. Mm -hmm. uh, there's only one way through that is to receive grace from a power higher than ourselves uh, to deal with my sinful issues. And so it's poverty when you get to that realization that you have nothing to give, that you're, you've opened the door for grace to begin. And so, but it's, it's a thing that you see inside of yourself. It's hard to understand that because it feels like, Hey, I should be a self-made man. I should be working from this place. But if you think about people around you, do you want to be around somebody who is coming from a place of pride? Look what I did. Or is it much more, isn't it great to be around people who are sharing their brokenness and who don't have all the answers mm -hmm. who you can just relate to the stories of life where um, God showed up and, and there was something that was miraculous, but it wasn't, look what I did. Look at my big car, look at my big house, yeah. look at uh, how I healed myself, all that. That's, that's not a person that you want to hang out with, right. uh, but somebody who's coming from a place of deep humility, mm -hmm. you can see it in others, but sometimes we still want to put on the show yeah, I was talking to a buddy of mine and he was like, Hey, we're, we're redoing something on the house because, um, you know, uh, we're having friends over and, and on the surface, we can like, well, why do you need to do that for, you know, you and I do, but from that person's perspective that was having the stuff done on the, the house, it was, I want them to see me in a certain light is basically what they're saying. They need yeah. to see that, Hey, the house is, looks nice or put together and, mm -hmm. Isn't it cool when somebody will invite you into their mess? Yeah. Not because you want to live in squalor and mess, but because there's a willingness to say, hey, I don't have to put on a show. I don't have to have the finest of things. We can still have a relationship. Mm -hmm. and my house is a mess, dude. So uh, it's hard to do. That's sometimes. why you're saying that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's hard to do my that. My house isn't as much of a mess, but yeah, yeah, you're you're Mr. <laughs> just because I liked. I'm a minimalist. Remember, you're a minimalist. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to talk about this tension for a second yes. too. And so there's something that, um, just so there's not confusion here, powerlessness doesn't mean we don't need to do anything. There's a separate concept right. out there, and that is, I'm going to put it stewardship. Mm -hmm. Like uh, as a cancer patient, you've been given a body. Uh, mm -hmm. as a gift. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also have responsibility to steward our bodies, to steward resources, mm -hmm. to, and that means to take care of, to, so powerlessness as a concept isn't about um, becoming irresponsible, taking our hands off and closing our eyes when we're driving down the road and saying, I'm powerless to steal their car, steer my car. It's, there's a responsibility to manage and steward the resources that we have around us. So this is, there's a tension that has to be understood. Mm -hmm. And I think you defined it well. It's like, it's a inner concept. It's like moving towards humility. It's, it's moving towards an understanding that ultimately, yes, I can do uh, everything in my power to steward these resources, but the outcome is still going to be whatever God chooses it to be. Right. I'm powerless to control the fact that the weather may change, hurricane may come, earthquake may happen uh, this afternoon, right? a million things. And for most people that are going to be listening to this, exactly as you said early on, they were powerless over the fact that they received a cancer diagnosis. Mm -hmm. It happened in their life. And that powerlessness, it reveals something about a greater powerlessness mm -hmm. that you talked about early on. It's like mm -hmm. you got to a point where 
you recognized I have zero power. Um, I had zero energy left even to steward at some point in time. And you became completely reliant for that period of time. Yeah. And I think, um, I'm very careful because I feel led to do this, but I was so powerless and so unable to control my circumstances that, um, the doctors call me an anomaly. I've said that, and I've lived far longer than what anyone expected, any New York doctor, anyone. And so I make sure that, uh, I receive none of the glory for that, uh, and that God gets the glory. And I think that's where, that's where he wants us to be. I feel that in my heart and life, that that's where he wants me to be. Yes. I want to talk about that. To give him credit. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I spoke at a church recently and I just felt led to talk about this particular gospel account where Jesus is speaking. It's like John chapter 15, but you know, he talks about being the vine and, and that the, that the branch has to be affixed to that vine and talked about, um, you know, certain things going on with that pruning, talked about pruning, but at the end of the paragraph, he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Mm. And I just was impressed with that. So anyway, comment, please. <laughs> comment, please. Please, <laughs> please. Well, what you shared was something that it, it reminded me back to the Shia interview and, and he said something that was uh, profound in coming on the backside of that. So finally somebody showed him grace and it opened a crack of something for opportunity in his life. And what happens is like when we get to total powerless, like you did, and you received a gift of grace, a rescue that had nothing to do with your power. It was just a gift from God. And when you move to the other side of these deep, powerless, complete powerless moments, there's a tendency to at some point want to re-pick up the control handles or something like that in the sense it's like, okay, I made it through and now and move back into manipulation. Um, and there's no peace in that. And so there's, there's a struggle, I think. And so I like what you said. It's like, hey, I'm trying to stay in this place where I continue to give the one who does have power the credit for everything that's happening in my life. And so that's why I wanted to go back and touch on it. It's like, and how do you do that? Because one of the things Shia mentioned was uh, how easy it was. And I find it for my own life, how easy it is. Hey, when, when the trial is over for that little window of time yeah, yeah. Uh, to try to repick back up that, well, I have control again. Now right. I have the ability to do something. I'm, I'm back in charge, but it's still an illusion. Right. And so how do you work against the illusion to not pick up that, that control thing? What do you have to do in your life to do that in your cancer journey? Yeah. It's, um, it's something I'm curious about. And yeah. I, I saw him wrestling with it. Even uh, in the interview, I was like, hey, look at me. I can almost use my testimony as a, you know, I'm on the other side and I'm making it. You just need to follow me as yeah. opposed to, no, I'm still that same piece of garbage guy who yeah. had grace given to him. Yeah. Um, and I'm not worthy of receiving that gift mm-hmm. that was given to me by this person, even this person that I abused. And how do I stay in that level of humility is a, seems yeah. like a really hard place. I mean, in a, in the cancer space for me, it's been pounded into me <laughs> through 19 years and six re- recurrences. And, you know, there were years where I had a medical appointment every week. So it was just, I'm, I'm a hard headed, thick headed, stubborn dude. And it was pounded into me that I'm not in charge. I'm not in control of this journey. This is a this is a God journey. This is what he's doing. And I think, let's say that I had surgical solutions and then I was fine. I mean, to me, it would still be a stark reminder to kind of revisit exactly what happened. I was I was going along in my day and my life and bang a diagnosis came from out of the blue. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I heard a message once on like that whole consider all joy when you have trials, but the, um, I don't know if this is right, but like the original language, maybe Greek, whatever was this concept of this ship sailing along and all, all of a sudden a pirate ship came on it and took it over with out of the blue. Didn't. And so, and I think that's, 
that's that's a that kind of a diagnosis cancer and going through that journey is I'm going to say wonderful reminder of the fact that we are not in control of our lives, that anything can happen at any point. Um, and you just have to open up your eyes and see that. It's a reality check, right? It is a reality check. Yeah. Yeah. I think the thing we want to leave people with though, is that it's not, that can sound overwhelming. Yes. But what I recognize from your journey and from my own journey is that it was an invitation to begin walking in humility. Yeah. A form of it, not perfect humility, but a form of humility in that. And what I hear you kind of saying, I mean, I think more than kind of, but I'm, I'm reinterpreting is that, and God's continuing to use that as a work of changing who you are and becoming completely reliant in your life. I know for me, the most attractive quality in a person is hum humility. It, not that they downgrade themselves or throw themselves down on the, you know, uh, on the carpet and, and criticize themselves, but there's a deep recognition that they're not in charge, that they're not in, in control. And there's even a joy that comes with that, a contentment with, with knowing that, that there's, that they have a higher power and there's, there's, a higher in our case it's Jesus and that I mean we there's so many promises that he gives about working in our best interest and doing things for our good and stuff like that. I know those are that's hard to talk like that, but um I, I mean I've come to really trust in Jesus and those promises, his words mm -hmm. that he'll never leave me nor forsake me. That those are big you know, when you're in the operating room or in a test or, you know, you, we don't get a chance to see Jesus physically, but to know that my higher power is there with me in spirit uh, is huge. It's the Cancer and Peace podcast. As yeah. I understand your journey, the way you got to peace was um, as you started writing on those promises, you began to rely on a power greater than yourselves. And that's where yep. real peace began. Yep. It was you were in a deep depression yep. uh, and you felt hopelessness. You got to powerlessness. Yep. And then you started relying on a power greater than yourself and real peace came in that. No matter what the outcome, you didn't know the outcome, but peace was in that, yep. relying on that higher power. And I, I remember speaking publicly and, and thinking to myself, Give me, Peter, give yourself four words or five words to say if your six children were in front of you and this was about life, what would you say, right? And after all this thinking and analyzing stuff, it came down to, I can't, Jesus can. That summed it up for me. Hmm. I can't do this journey, but Jesus can do it in me and through me. I'm powerless in this. He's powerful. Yeah. I think that's such a great way of thinking about it's a it's it's getting to an understanding of what reality really is. Right. And so and it doesn't have to just be in the cancer space, it can be in every space of your life. And so I think of the just the people I speak with on a daily basis, the brokenness is unbelievable. The financial brokenness, relationship brokenness, emotional brokenness, you know. Yeah. When people are faced with their brokenness it's a great opportunity to say, Hey, I don't have any power or control. I mean, you don't, if you have a wayward spouse, what control do you have over that person? Yeah. There's so much. Yeah. And you can think about people are so going many through examples. career yeah. uh, situations. I, yep. I'll never forget our good friend. You and I both, uh, know one that put the, uh, the, the, the note or the, um, uh, the journal on your chest when you were yeah. in, uh, your low moment. I remember we were going through something difficult here in the ministry. And I remember him saying to me, he's like, Hey, as I was coming up the front drive, um, one of the things that God had made clear is like, I appointed Sean for to lead this ministry. And when I'm ready for him to be done, you know, I'll make that decision. And so it, and it changed my perspective because it is in the same vein as I can sit around trying to strive to hold on to position power, whatever else, you know, in, in a career position or a managing organization. But 
if the truth is, is that God appoints leaders mm-hmm. and unappoints mm-hmm. and chooses their timing and where they're going next. And he says that about even politics and, mm-hmm. you know, he appoints the president of the United States. He appoints mm-hmm. kings and leaders it changes your perspective when you live off of that, because then I don't need to get as wrapped up in all the things because I'm powerless over who's Mm -hmm. going to be the next president of the United States. Do I have a stewardship that I should do by voting and participating? Yes. Mm -hmm. But ultimately I'm powerless over who is the next president, who's the leader here yeah, and what's going on. You have something you want to say? Yeah, because this is the cancer and peace journey for me. Because that, what you just said is huge. And then from there, the practical reality was, well, what's my part? And I said to surrender and trust. And it's interesting because the word surrender doesn't sound like it's a, it's a good word, yeah. right? The white but, flag. Yeah. But it's to, it's the powerless, but to surrender and then trust, yeah. like you're trusting. It's a, what you said was great because it's like, Hey, God's in charge when he's done with you doing this task, he has something else for you to do, whatever. And I feel like for me personally in this cancer journey, when he's done with me doing what I'm doing now, I could be taken home to heaven. I could be in a whole nother thing. But all I know is right now I need to just surrender and trust that he has my best interests at heart. These are, these are earth shaking concepts, but also really difficult to get to. Uh, at least in, in my life, it was not an easy journey to get to these points. It's a constant challenge against yeah. what is reality and, and, yeah. and to be able to live in that. That's that's kind of why I was asking. It's like, it's so easy to to try to pick up that control thing again. And yeah. so, because it's been a blessing for me not to feel a need to try to hang on here yeah. in ministry or anything else. Yeah. It's just, I don't, have to, I don't have to hold on to that uh, mm-hmm. to strive for it. It just doesn't matter. It doesn't mean don't, to not do my best. It doesn't mean to, to not, you know, give effort and be right. as engaged as I can. It means I don't have to worry about the outcomes. I don't have to, I can just right. trust and that uh, I'm being. I'll on this. I'll just be very vulnerable about my marriage. It was the same thing. It was, I don't have control over my spouse and, um, and I, but I could, I wanted, you know, we, we, we wanted to work on it, counseling and all that. We did everything we could, but in the end, you know, parties chose to go their own separate way. I don't have control over that. Right. You know, I can't control my spouse. She She's going to do her own journey as I'm going to do my own journey. I'm not casting any blame on this right. podcast, but um, uh, it just goes to, and I've I had a lot of peace with that. I have a lot of peace with the whole recovery concept because what it says to me is I'm responsible for my lane only. I love that. I'm not responsible for this other person's lane and their journey. I'm only responsible for my journey. And um, I have enough prob- problems with myself. There's no way I could help or convince someone in their lane. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I have enough problems with myself. That's so true. Well, I think you know, we've kind of. It's great, though. We put so, some of the topic. some meat on the bone here for this. And so powerlessness yeah. is not a concept of saying there's no power in God. Powerlessness is a state that we need to get to in ourselves. It's a recognition that there's a different reality. Um, and if we can rely on the power uh, of, of an entity that's higher than ourselves, who has the power to uh, help us to recover, to find healing and hope, that's where real peace is at. And that's mm. kind of the message of we wanted to to talk about today, but to get there, you have to actually get to an end of yourself. You have to get to at least this internal place of powerlessness and it's a place of humility, but it's a place of great hope. Then also it's not hopelessness. It's a place of great hope because if my, if my hope is in my power, yeah, we're in trouble. (laughs) So, but that's the message of our, that we wanted to just talk about today in this podcast. So great. Any final words? Are we, uh, that's awesome. So uh, that's where we're going to end at today. Thanks a bunch for for listening or watching this Mm -hmm. podcast. And we'll see you on future episodes. If you want more resources, go to cancerandpeace.com and you'll see Peter's book and others. Yes. Yeah, we got just to mention the other resources. There's arrows if you go on the website and you can go to Wild at Heart Resources, Celebrate Recovery, Emotionally Healthy Discipleship Resources. So check it out, everybody. And thanks a bunch for listening. Thank you.